With the experience and resources for cases throughout Louisiana, Walters Papillon Thomas Collins LLC is proud to support LPB, specializing in personal injury and wrongful death, with information at lawbr.net. So thank you all, uh, most importantly, for, for having me here. Um, I've actually never attended a Rotary Club meeting before, so uh, it's really exciting and interesting to see how that all goes. Um, uh, I'll note, uh, as I was driving in this morning, I was stuck in traffic on I-10 and noticed that the, the billboard, at least as I passed, it still had a big picture of Dr. Gee, uh, and <laughs> said, she'd be talking today, the Rotarians, and I thought, oh gosh, I actually told my chief of staff, I was like, we need to keep the car running, and <laughs> out back, um, I may get you know run out on a pitchfork, but uh, no, I, I appreciate the gracious invitation and your willingness to uh, hear me uh, prattle on uh, instead of Dr. Gee. Um, uh, and so as you heard, she uh, has announced her resignation, her desire to step down to pursue a new opportunity, um, which she'll be announcing uh, when, when she sees fit. Um, but I'm you know, happy to be able to share uh, the, the speech um, that she was going to give on the state of the state and health, uh, because we have so much to be thankful for in the guidance and leadership uh, that both Dr. Gee and the governor um, have provided over the last four years. And actually, to sort of tee up the, the comments, what I want to do is share with you a, a video that we produced uh, at the um, uh, Department of Health um, that talks a little bit about you know, some of those changes or some of those impacts. And we're going to see if the audio works, but uh, we'll start there. <laughs> Yeah, we can, I, I don't want to force you people to, to read a white font, so maybe since the volume's not working, we'll just go ahead and, and, and talk. But um, we're hoping that this will be actually shared in, in broader circles. What, what uh, those of you in the back couldn't hear, but maybe those of you uh, closest could, could read, um, was really sort of the personal stories of individuals touched by uh, especially Medicaid expansion. And, and the success of Medicaid expansion in Louisiana is something for us to be truly proud of. Uh, it's making a difference in the lives of some of our most vulnerable residents uh, and really helping drive great changes uh, across the state, even outside of health care. Um, we're proud of the governor uh, and the progress this administration has made when it comes to Medicaid expansion and improving access to our health care partners. Through expansion, we've cut the rate of uninsured in this state in half, with around 8% of folks still uninsured. And that's tremendous, and has a, a, a really achieved a lot of national attention um, uh, for that achievement. Uh, that also has created new jobs, and, and uh, as you'll hear, uh, driven the economy forward. Because of healthcare access expansion uh, that's extended to our residents, Literally tens of thousands of people are able to get uh, screening tests for cancers, more than 70,000 people getting colonoscopies, more than 40,000 people um, uh, getting screening man mammograms, more than 100,000 people getting really critical behavioral health care. Um, and that's at a time when we know that our state is uh, really being pinned down like so much of the country uh, by the opioid <laughs> crisis. Um, so expansion really comes at the right time to help those people access treatment uh, for their addiction and enable them to 
uh, engage in recovery and then uh, go back into the into the rest of the work sector. Um, we've had the largest growth uh, in federally qualified health centers. I'm, I'm pointing at Tim Young, uh, one of our local FQHCs, uh, our community health center uh, leaders. Um, and unlike many in our region, we have not seen a single rural hospital close. For those of you that your business extends, your travels extend to our neighboring states, you know that in our region especially, um, that these tough times uh, from a healthcare economic standpoint are leading to rural hospitals uh, dwindling. And certainly for those businesses, that's, that's bad news, but it's even worse news for the residents of the communities that really depend on those hospitals. And fortunately, because of expansion and, and the work of the department, um, we've been able to avoid that fate, and hopefully we can continue to do so going forward. It's also been good for the state budget. Uh, as a re result of, of Medicaid expansion, we've saved Louisiana taxpayers more than $282 million. I mean, you're talking about a relatively um, uh, smaller budget at the state level. That's, that's really big. All in all, we think Medicaid expansion has been a resounding success for Louisiana. And we've got some data to support that too. So a recent study by the Louisiana uh, State University uh, showed that expansion is probably supporting more than 14,000 jobs across the state and driving more than $889 million uh, in, in personal uh, earnings. Um, another study by Tulane, so that we don't favor one school over the other, uh, showed the number of people who said that they were putting off going to the doctor because of cost, dropped by over a quarter. Uh, and the number of people who don't take medications as prescribed because they can't afford them dropped by two thirds. So I'm a primary care physician. I can tell you that nothing is more important than knowing the people who I'm seeing in clinic, the, the issues that we're raising, we can actually uh, meet those needs. There's nothing more frustrating than having somebody come in I know and they know what needs to be done, but I also know that they're not going to be able to afford that insulin when they leave. They're not going to be able to afford those medications to really enact that uh, action plan. And what we're seeing here after expansion is the ability to meet those needs um, uh, and, and really make a big difference. People who get to go to the doctor um, when they need it, take their medications as prescribed, are less likely to miss work. Um, they're more likely to perform well at work. And that is when I talk about that sort of broader economic engine that healthcare expansion can be, um, some, of, some of those key drivers. So the reality is that Medicaid expansion, from our perspective and hopefully yours, uh, has been a great success for the state, bringing federal tax dollars home to Louisiana and really allowing us to solve budget crises, keep tops in place, uh, importantly, uh, supporting roads and infrastructures. It's not lost on all of you, I think, especially since you're civic leaders and business leaders in the community, that it's not just that the healthcare system uh, can be too expensive, but that's really eating the financial ability of the state and your community to meet those other needs. It's eating the budget for all of those other areas. And so taking some of that weight off allows us to focus on things like education and infrastructure. In addition to, in addition to expansion, uh, under the leadership of uh, Governor John Bell Edwards and Secretary Gee, uh, the department's really focused on internal improvement and other improvements that we can drive uh, across the healthcare landscape. Uh, so my uh, day job is Assistant Secretary of the Office of Public Health. Um, and so I'm particularly excited to, to note some achievements that we've driven in that area. Uh, most notably uh, in the area of HIV and sexually transmitted infections. Um, so because of the work of the department, but also our partners in the federally quali qualified health centers, our hospital partners, uh, and really engaged community groups, um, for the first time in 10 years, we've seen the rate of new HIV infections, the case uh, number rather of new HIV infections, dip below 1,000. So the last time that that happened was 2005, 2006, and we know what was going on at that time. And so we really think that actually the Katrina and Rita effects probably meant that we were missing, we were missing cases. So the last real time that we've had this number of cases probably goes back to 1988. And that's when the epidemic was really reaching Louisiana. And so uh, without being too wonky, uh, in, in, when we look at diseases uh, from a public health standpoint, we have these things called epi curves. It's essentially a large bell curve. And what you want to be is on the other side of that curve. And this is where we're starting to see that peak and coming down. And so that's really great news for the state. It shows that we're making um, some headway. Uh, and we're seeing similar headway when it comes to sexually transmitted infections, frankly. Um, this year, we got a lot of good news about hard work that's been going on for years. But whereas, say, in 2017, we ranked seventh for primary and secondary syphilis, I'm sorry, we ranked third for primary and secondary syphilis nationwide, uh, we're now down to seventh. 
Um, that may not seem like where you want to be. It's not where I want to be, but it's so much better than being third. Uh, same for congenital syphilis. Here, we led the nation in cases of congenital syphilis. Uh, I know there are probably many physicians, nurses, um, health workers in the audience. Um, I can tell you in my training, uh, which wasn't that long ago, uh, congenital syphilis is not something that I was really trained to treat. It shouldn't be the kind of thing that I should ever observe. But we had more than 50 cases uh, in 2017. And that was the result of not getting people treatment for syphilis up front before they were um, uh, giving birth to children. So having a child burn, born with syphilis, uh, really inexcusable uh, in the 21st century, certainly uh, in 2017 or 2019. As a result of concerted efforts that we've made, again, with partners, but also through our own work with our parish health units throughout the state, um, we've now driven down to third place uh, for, for congenital syphilis. One of the other things to highlight there, because again, that may not sound as exciting as, it, as I think it truly is, is that uh, at the same time that these results are coming out, we had the Centers for Disease Control at a national level raising alarm bells this year saying all of these numbers nationwide are going in the wrong direction. So it's not just that we're sort of moving uh, down or other people are moving above us. We're actually turning the tide when the rest of the country is seeing higher rates of sexually transmitted infections, higher rates of these uh, diseases. We are truly um, uh, leading. Um, and, and we're seeing that as well in, in gonorrhea, for instance, where we were ranked fifth in 2017 and now we're down to third. So across the board, really trying uh, to get treatment into communities and, and, and reduce those barriers to treatment. Another area where we're leading, frankly, the entire nation uh, is in the treatment for hepatitis C. So for those of you not familiar, hepatitis C is the deadliest infectious disease in the United States. It kills more people every year than the next 60 reportable conditions combined. So if you think of an infection, actually think of all the infections you can probably think of, add them together, and hepatitis C is still killing more people than that every year. And the challenge is that these have been silent deaths because hepatitis C is a slow killer, and the people it's killing are often some of the most marginalized in our community. Um, and so under uh, Secretary Gee's leadership, I'm, I'm extremely proud uh, that earlier this year, we finalized a deal um, with a pharmaceutical manufacturer, Segwa Therapeutics, uh, which is a subsidiary of Gilead um, uh, Sciences, a large pharmaceutical manufacturer you may be familiar with, uh, to establish the nation's first modified subscription model, essentially a deal with a drug company that allows us uh, to cap our spending as a state, to essentially say that for the next five years, we are not going to spend more as a state than we did in fiscal year 2019, but gain unrestricted access, unlimited access to their Cadillac drug to cure hepatitis C, the deadliest infection, in about three months. One pill a day, very few side effects, really just turning this disease uh, on its head. Um, medications became available on July 15th. And since July 15th, and, and you know, Tim and others may even be able to speak to this, we've seen just a tremendous number of folks come out to be treated, and we've already made uh, tremendous uh, headway. We announced, uh, or we have a dashboard that you're all welcome to go to on our, on our website that sort of will give, allow you to, to keep track of how we're, we're doing with treatment. But in the first four and a half months of this um, uh, new model of hepatitis C uh, treatment access, we've treated nearly 2,500 people. To give you context, in the first 75 days of this uh, model, of this new uh, program, we treated more people than we did in the preceding year. And we're on track to uh, achieve what is our ultimate goal, eliminating this infectious disease. When we talk about reducing health care costs, one of the ways for us to do that is to get rid of conditions that we can. Hepatitis C is one of those conditions. It's very rare to be able to cure a virus. <laughs> Here's one we can. And so what we've done as a department and as the Office of Public Health uh, leading in this space is set the goal of eliminating hep hepatitis C across the state by the end of 2024. So in five years, doing what entire countries are aiming to do but, but have yet to achieve. Um, and so far, with the pace that we're getting people treated, the pace that we're screening people to let them know about this uh, infection, uh, we are on track uh, to achieve that. It's early days, but we're prioritizing really reaching our Medicaid populations and our corrections populations, those people who the state has uh, a direct um, leadership in their care. Um, so that we can make sure that those most vulnerable populations are being treated. But we also want to expand um, expand that work to, to really all Louisianans and try to uh, reach everybody in the state. Commercially insured, uninsured, be the first state in this country to eliminate hepatitis C. That's getting a lot of national attention, uh, and it's the good kind of national attention, where people are talking about Louisiana leading and saying, how can we do that in our own home states? 
So our, our work with hepatitis C also represents something that's unique um, uh, among states in our relationship with the Department of Corrections. As I told you, one of our goals is to eliminate hepatitis C not just in Medicaid, not just uh, statewide, but, but in particular focusing initially on the Department of Corrections. Uh, and that's relatively rare. And, and it's because we have been forging a partnership with the Department of Corrections to make sure that those people in our, in our custody and our care are receiving health care that they need. Um, and one of the ways that um, we're hoping to also make sure that they um, are able to reenter communities and become uh, active parts of healthy communities is making sure that when they're about to be released, they're linked into to Medicaid um, and have that health care continue once they leave. We know, for instance, that um, for somebody who's suffering from a substance use disorder and then uh, leaves prison and reenters their community, they are six times more likely to die in that initial phase of reentering their communities if they don't have access to a provider who can help them make that connection back uh, to, to treatment care, to, to recovery. And that not only is there a high rate of death, but that you know potential re-engagement with substance use, uh, frankly, is what, what leads to the circle of uh, recidivism, having to be uh, rearrested, having to, to cost a lot of money to the state. And so we can break that chain, help somebody get their life in order uh, through that health care foundation uh, that really helps all of us and makes us safer. Um, ultimately, we see as a critical state uh, uh, the need uh, needed to achieve one health Sorry, ultimately we see health as a critical state needed to achieve one's great ambitions. Uh, along those lines, we are focused on leveraging the expansion uh, of, of uh, health care and, and uh, health in our state uh, to help more residents really engage, re-engage in workforce and reach financial independence. Uh, one example of that is uh, in Monroe. Uh, we're currently running a pilot program called Kickstart that connects our Medicaid beneficiaries with job training. Um, we're hearing early successes. It's still an early program that was launched at the end of last year. One example is a, a, a son um, who's himself a Medicaid uh, enrollee, uh, enrolled in a training program studying alongside of his mother, also a Medicaid enrollee, uh, to learn how to drive forklifts uh, and, and uh, really you know, have something uh, that they can be proud of in a way to, to, um, uh, to, to meet their needs. Beyond these programs, uh, the department is also very focused on looking inwardly and seeing how we can improve um, the way that we do business and, and make sure that we're being good stewards of the both state and federal dollars that you entrust us with. Um, we've striven to be more efficient uh, and do more uh, for you. Our goal is to ensure uh, that we're effective and that we're eliminating waste. Uh, and so under the Secretary's leadership, um, we've uh, started training our employees on a program uh, that was first developed in the manufacturing sector, sector and many of you may uh, actually be engaged with, uh, called Lean Six Sigma. And we're actually fortunate to be joined uh, by our own uh, master black belt, um, uh, Mindy Richard here, um, who's really uh, taken on the charge from the Secretary to have um, this methodology of continuous process improvement um, spread across the department and find ways that we can uh, make any tweak but also pretty big tweaks uh, to improve the way that, that uh, we do business. Um, we now empower our employees through this effort to fix uh, complicated issues um, and we, we've uh, really made this a broad cross-department effort uh, including getting uh, leadership trained with a, a yellow belt so for those uh, who have uh, gone through uh, uh, martial arts training or have children that have gone through martial arts training, you know, there's a progression of belts. Uh, and so yellow belts uh, near the beginning uh, part of that. Um, and so the leaders got that. We're the sort of the learners. Um, but then training an entire cadre of frontline leaders uh, to a green belt status, where they're really um, not only themselves making impact, but learning how to run teams uh, that, that make impact and improving our efficiency. And, and again, those people not only do their individual programs and projects, but then they become um, <clears throat> proselytizers for you know, the, the Church of Lean Six Sigma and spread that out throughout the department. And it's really the kind of fire that just catches on and hopefully leads to efficiencies in every possible way you can find it. Again, trying to do more uh, with what we have. This has also uh, helped us refine and, and, and uh, regain our focus on outcomes and quality improvement um, that uh, have a focus on, on health. One example of our uh, focus on outcomes uh, is our perinatal uh, quality collaborative. Um, so this is really focused on reducing the number of women uh, or, or birthing persons who uh, die or are seriously injured uh, related to childbirth. Um, childbirth should be one of the healthiest states in, in a, a birthing person's life, in, in a woman's life. Um, and unfortunately, we lead the nation in the number of women dying during childbirth. Um, and it's a complicated problem. 
It's, it's, it takes an entire community, including our healthcare partners, but also our community partners and the individuals themselves at highest risk, coming together and talking about what we can do. And that's what the collaborative is really focused on. How can we identify the issues that we can tackle and move forward in a measurable way uh, to put policies in place and, and practices in place that will reduce those, um, uh, those injuries. Um, and uh, we've set a, a goal of reducing maternal morbidity and mortality by 20% by Mother's Day of this year, 2020. So we set that goal Mother's Day of last year, 2019. Hopefully we'll be able to give you good news uh, when we come around uh, to, uh, to Mother's Day this year. We've already seen some early successes. Since 2016, not just this collaborative, but the broader work that the department's been doing has led to a 32% reduction in the severe consequences of maternal hemorrhage um, and, and for women who are giving birth. And that is a, that is a significant impact. Um, one area that we're seeing uh, uh, ongoing concerns, though, is that those impacts on women's health are not equally shared. Unfortunately, we know that if you're a black woman giving birth, you are four times more likely to die in childbirth or after childbirth than a white woman. And that's inexcusable, and there's not a good reason for it. We need to focus on that, we need to measure that, and we need to build programs and, and systems and answers to be able to reverse those trends. We don't want any woman to die in childbirth or after childbirth, but we also have to um, look at the, the major challenges in health equity uh, that are sometimes most uh, evinced by what we're currently seeing in, in maternal health. Also internally, we've been able uh, to, to make some pretty big achievements for those we serve. One of the ones we're most proud of is eliminating uh, the wait list um, for our citizens with developmental disabilities. Um, uh, as you may know, if you uh, have anybody uh, in your family or know of people who have developmental disabilities, there are a lot of supports and services that not only those individuals need, but the families of those individuals need uh, in order for uh, them to have the most fulfilling life that they can and engage in meaningful ways. Um, unfortunately, access to those services uh, is, is really has been a challenge. And for years in Louisiana, we had wait lists that were uh, over 10,000 long. Uh, people waiting to get those services. Um, and through a focus on continuous quality improvement, through a focus on saying what's right is what serves the people we serve, the department under Secretary Lee, uh, Gee's leadership was able to eliminate that wait list so that people don't have to wait for those needed services. We're now focusing or shifting that focus to our aging and adult services. So again, you know, we want a situation where people are able to age with dignity in their home communities. It's not only what they want, it's also what's most cost effective and beneficial for our communities. And so there's another wait list um, with literally thousands of people waiting on it for the services and supports that they need to be able to be uh, served in the lowest cost, highest impact way in their communities that we're working really, um, uh, really focused to, to, uh, to reduce. And and already we've been able to eliminate thousands of people waiting in those lines, and our goal is to get to zero. Um, we've also tried, though, where people are needing higher levels of care to make sure that those care settings are what we would want for our family members as well. And our, um, uh, the dramatic improvements that we've seen in nursing home quality uh, over the last four years, I think, is a testament to that, again, in partnership with our nursing homes. Uh, many of the state's older adults um, uh, have uh, benefited from uh, training around uh, uh, pressure ulcers uh, and being able to reduce those in nursing facilities. Um, and we've moved from being 50th in the country for nursing home quality uh, to 45th. Again, showing that it's not just a matter of, of um, uh, seeing those iterative improvements, we're sort of moving out ahead of our neighbors because of this focus and this uh, way that we're trying to do this work. We have more work to do. We're not happy with 45th, um, but the progress is important. And that momentum, we want to continue moving forward. So I know that I've spoken extremely quickly and that I've covered a large uh, a number of things, but I, I hope I'm leaving you with the impression uh, that we have many healthcare challenges, though we have many healthcare challenges in Louisiana, we're really seeing a return on investments, not only of Medicaid expansion, but of the partnerships that have been forged over the last four years and that that is leading to real health improvements for the citizens of our state. We're very optimistic uh, at the Department of Health. Uh, sometimes my team tells me I'm a little bit too much of an optimist, um, even for, for state government. Um, but but uh, we know that we didn't get here without hard work. We know that we're not going to continue without hard work. And most importantly, we know that we can't do any of this, and we haven't done any of this alone. We do it with you and with uh, communities and leaders across the state. 
We know that achieving this is going to take us uh, doing more uh, going forward than just uh, uh, increasing access to healthcare. Though, do not get me wrong, that is critical. Um, it will mean that we also have to work to improve our efficiency. We have to improve the impact of the healthcare system as well uh, for the citizens that are accessing it. Ultimately, it means working to improve uh, health upstream, reaching folks before they're ill. Um, to really uh, reduce the burden that um, uh, uh, poor health is, is having on our state and on our economy um, and eliminate these preventable um, uh, health care conditions uh, that our citizens are currently facing. We want to make bold, bold moves, uh, and I know that Louisianans have the, the spirit to take this up, and I thought I might just share one bit of work uh, that we've launched uh, in the Office of Public Health that, that is about making a bold move, again, that is unique in the nation. Um, and that's really building the infrastructure so that we can connect what's going on in our healthcare sector with where the people we're serving live in their communities. So we've piloted a program in St. Landry Parish uh, currently um, that is focused on leveraging the reach that we have in the communities through our parish health unit to screen individuals for what we call health-related social needs. These are needs like housing instability, uh, access to healthy food, transportation needs, uh, utilities needs, Exposure to violence, employment, as you heard, being really critical, education that sort of enables that employment, and frankly, justice involvement and all that that can um, mean for uh, the trajectory somebody's life takes. Identify if those needs exist at the individual level, and then work one-on-one -on -one through community health workers, members of the community themselves, to connect those individuals with those needs to resources that frankly already exist in their communities. But the way that our systems are built are so siloed and hard to navigate that people don't know how to find those connections, how to, how to meet those needs. And so we can serve in the Office of Public Health and the Department of Health as that connective tissue that helps learn what's going on in a community and connect people to meet those needs. That's exciting, but we know that just doing that is not going to be enough because um, there's a lot of need. There's a lot of need in this state. Nearly 50% of our, of our uh, citizens live uh, around 200% uh, of poverty or less. So even if they're employed, and, and about 30% of our population is employed, but in that asset limited income constrained employed category, they still have needs. They still have needs that employment doesn't fix. Um, and we need to help connect them to those services. We're going to outclass those services. But we don't know as communities, as the state, how to meet those needs until we know what those needs are. And so this system, going down to the individual level, getting information about individual needs, and then looking at them literally on a map and saying, where are the pockets of food insecurity? Where are the pockets of housing needs? So that then we can come back to you as a community, as leaders in the community, not just elected leaders, but financial leaders, employers, and say, what do you think? Where should we be investing? Where should, what should we prioritize? If we're going to build a new supermarket in the parish, let's not build it where there's already three. There's an area over here that needs, that people are telling us that they need services. And I operate the, the uh, WIC program, the Women, Infant, and Children program. At the Department of uh, uh, Children and Financial Services, we have the SNAP program. Those are people who are supported to also uh, come and shop at those stores as sort of a, a ready-made a ready population to help also secure um, the economic future for that, for that store. So let's start making those connections. And that's what we're doing through that pilot in St. Landry. It's been so successful, literally thousands of people screened, hundreds of people um, having their needs met, um, that we are now looking to expand that across um, uh, other parishes across the state. We're going to start with moving to six more uh, high-need uh, parishes, and then eventually our goal is to have that be statewide. Not a new program uh, to create an umbrella uh, or to you know, sort of take over people's uh, roles, but really to just be a connector for these programs, including yours, that already exist in these communities to make them more efficient and have higher impact. So I appreciate your leadership. Um, I appreciate uh, hopefully uh, finding a new group of willing partners as I come down to sit at tables with you uh, to make those changes. I know that there is much more that we have to do for our communities, but I know that there's much more that we can do uh, for our communities to improve their health um, and, and do that in, in innovative ways uh, that also drive the economy and meet all of our needs. And so uh, thank you for your attention and I thank you for your support of the department and the work we do. If there are any questions for Dr. B, we have stands with microphones in the two sides of the. Uh... Barbara. Good. Good. It's on Tina. Thanks very much for your.
really excellent presentation. Um, there's some powerful research from the Academy of Gerontology and Higher Education that is um, strongly supporting a movement away from nursing homes and toward um, more efforts for aging in place. And I wonder what the department's position is on that and whether or not the movement toward aging in place uh, methods might bring us a little bit um, higher than 45th and do so more quickly. Yeah, so I, I, the easy answer is yes, and, and we do have a lot of work there. I think not just nursing homes, but when we look at the healthcare sector in general, um, you know, one of the things that's hard to sort of uh, keep in mind when you're a physician and you're, you're purview of people's health lives is 15 minutes, is that everybody, including us, go out and spend the rest of our lives outside of that clinic visit. Um, and that's where we can keep people the healthiest. And so when we look at every healthcare setting, um, we have a model that really waits for people to get sick and come in uh, and use care. What we'd rather is keep people healthy and out of some of those settings, not because we want to see those settings go out of business. Frankly, we know there's going to be more than enough business for the nursing home uh, community. There's going to be more enough business for our hospital community as well. It's so that they are serving the right people who need that level of care, but by and large, many of our citizens that, that um, uh, currently are in some of those settings could be better served potentially at home with family, but with family that's supported. And so that's been the focus of the department. That's part of what I was talking about with removing that wait list is how do we put more support for those services so that you're not sort of waiting for access to those community wraparound services that let you be successful in moving back to the community because it's not just cheaper for the healthcare system, it's better for their quality of life and for uh, quality outcomes. So that is a big, uh, a big focus. I think so my question was really ditto to that, but is there going to be a shift in funding from the respite funding um, to nursing homes as opposed to the portion that the community gets in the, in the other entities that provide respite for them? Because it's obviously very heavy to the nursing homes. Is that going to shift? I know there's a task group looking at trying to get that, but it's very difficult to um, to take on the nursing homes. So, do I, do I need to repeat the question, or are we? Uh, so, I mean, I, I will uh, give you an unsatisfying answer and say, unfortunately, that's really outside of my purview in public health. Uh, we do have an entire uh, office that's really focused on a couple that that work on. Uh, individuals that need both skilled nursing but also potentially nursing home services and respite care services. So can't speak to their budgets, but I will sort of just you know double down on we understand that we want to be treating people in the in the right place at the right level of care uh, for everybody's best interests. Also unfortunately again we are you know 49th in health. We know that there's a huge amount of morbidity in our communities. I don't think this is a zero sum game right now. I don't think that we have to think about it as there's not enough work for all of us to do. Frankly, there are more people who are suffering than we have the ability to reach. And so my hope is that um, whatever the solution is that, that we're moving forward, we're, we're meeting everybody's needs. I have a question. Look back to you. Oh. Wait. I'll just speak really loudly. I, I, I promise this isn't an unfriendly question. I just would like to know the government's answer to it. it as I understand it, in Louisiana, a family can have a household income of about $75,000, maybe a, a husband and father, four children, or however the family's composed. And under the CHIP program, that family would have Medicaid. And under the Lamoms program, up to about fifty thousand dollars in household income, and the state <coughs> program would pay the cost of the, of the birth. So, my question is really this: Is it is do we understand? I guess the sustainability of of these numbers long term. I, I've heard that at some point we could lose the expansion, we lose the funding, and I, I guess as, as business owners and people who pay a lot of taxes. Is this a sustainable program, and have, what is the data on whether people who have a household income of seventy five thousand dollars, who aren't, I assume, aren't buying private insurance, is there a better way? Uh, that, that's that's my question. Well, especially, I mean, it's not intended to be a last bit's loaded. Um, 
Yeah, I mean, I think there's there's a lot in your question, um, and you know, I'll say again. So, unfortunately, Medicaid is not something that I lead either, so I'm not familiar with the specific uh, income eligibilities for each of those programs. We actually operate. We, you know, I think the the uh, state talks about sort of the expansion population, traditional Medicaid, maybe CHIP, maybe LaMoms. There's actually, I think, something like 17, 19 different Medicaid programs for for different groups um, that all have different reasons that you're getting ver different aspects to healthcare. So, so I won't go into those details, but I think. The, the, the root of your question is about the sustainability of what's going on in, in health care access. Um, and obviously that's not only pertinent here, that's a national conversation that, that we're having as well. You know, what I'll say is that um, there's a lot in there. It's not just about thinking about the individual and the access. There's also then, even for folks who have access, the costs of care and what we've been seeing uh, there. And I, I think that this is where we get to talking about accountability, building infrastructure so that everybody is um, seeing potentially those same costs might be a, a really helpful way for folks to better move resources uh, because it then makes you a willing partner and, a, and an excited partner um, in building that sustainability. I think as a business owner, you want to see that sustainability because we know that, for instance, when we poll uh, Louisianans on how often they're ill, both physically and from a behavioral health or mental standpoint. Currently, the average Louisianan tells us that they spend 10 days out of 30 sick. And, and not just, so it's not just a question of access to healthcare, it's how healthy is that individual? And are we, through giving them that access to healthcare, keeping them healthy so that we can reduce those numbers? That has a direct impact, I don't need to tell you, on all of you, if you're employing those individuals, if they're not showing up to work because they're sick. And so the answer to that is, is yes, healthcare if you have a need there, but it's much more importantly, what are we doing uh, to really make sure that we're keeping people healthy in the first place? So I don't know the, the future budget. Um, I don't know some of those questions, and I certainly can't prognosticate on um, Medicaid expansion. That's a national level conversation. But what I can say is, what's going on in healthcare spending in the United States is not sustainable, and the answer is not just to continue to turn the screws alone on healthcare, it's to think about what we can do to improve health, and I'm telling you that from my biased public health perspective, from a public health answer. Last question. Um, to that point, when we talk about sustainability and spending, uh, beyond Medicaid, there's a huge, uh, there's a huge shift in funding for health care, and it's going to value-based value -based care. And I was just wondering if the main policy for Louisiana, are you forming work groups and helping people adjust to what's going to be the future in value-based care? Yeah, so again, uh, slightly outside of my wheelhouse in Office of Public Health, but I can tell you my, you know, my, few, my previous career at the Innovation Center, we were really driving the national conversation uh, on value-based care and, and a lot of the programs that are sort of guiding that transition to uh, really moving from fee-for-service to, to fee-for-value. Um, so in the state, though, we have made some, some moves in that direction. I'll, I'll just point out one is, um, a, a network of primary care providers across the state already participate in one of the more innovative, um, what we call alternative payment models, called uh, the Comprehensive Primary P Primary Care Plus model, CPC Plus. Um, that brings not together not only Medicare to the table in trying to drive that movement to value, but also uh, commercially uh, commercial payers and commercially insured individuals, um, and Medicaid. Uh, at least two of the MCOs are, are participating, the managed care organizations are participating in that. And the focus of that model is redesigning primary care so that I'm not just churning through seven minute visits and 15 minute visits, but I now am being told you're being held accountable for an outcome and you decide how you shape your practice within constraints so that you can meet the needs for that population. And I'm successful if I'm able to bring somebody in more often that needs to be brought in more often. I'm able to spend more time with them if they need more time, and if I can just, you know, give you a call or you send me, you know, over your, uh, you know, over email your glucometer results for how your diabetes is going, I can do that, and I'm not married to this reimbursement cycle that our current healthcare system uh, drives. So that's an example that's already going on. We have one of the largest accountable care organization networks in the country here in Louisiana through Allidade. Um, and so uh, this is already happening. We've doubled down on that at the department in the latest round of uh, Medicare managed care contracts. You'd have seen that um, we called out and said, we need you to give us your plans for value-based payments. We want you to move along this continuum of fee-for-service, churn and burn to where we want to be, which is really holding you accountable for outcomes and cost. And you get to manage what goes on in between. It's a slow transition. There's, as, as I was talking about with uh, Edgardo, there's, 
um, uh, frankly, the folks even at CMS, I can say this now, throwing stones from outside, that we had to convince to be willing to let go of some of those threads that they have, some of those levers and controls, those check boxes that he was talking about, um, to really focus in on those outcomes. Um, so it's not gonna happen overnight. It's also on the provider side, a completely different way of practicing. And so we also have to help providers as they move through those transitions. So we have things called quality improvement organization, quality improvement networks, one that exists here in, New Orleans, in, uh, in uh, Louisiana, that can help partner with clinics and with systems that want to make those changes. So it's going to take time, but we've definitely put our stake in the ground that that's the direction Louisiana needs to go in. Uh, it's the only way that we manage the unsustainability of our healthcare costs. With the experience and resources for cases throughout Louisiana, Walters Papillon Thomas Collins LLC is proud to support LPB, specializing in personal injury and wrongful death with information at lawbr.net.